Chapter 33. Curious Remarks. A few minutes before midnight, Narcissa sent me to the large gate of the chambers. The Samaritans must have been close at hand. It was essential to watch for their return in order to prepare for them in time. I excitedly walked down the pathway amid leaf-covered sheltering trees. Here, tree trunks that reminded me of the hoary oaks of earth. Over there, fanciful leaves that brought to mind the acacia and the pine. The balsamic air was like a blessing. In spite of the broad windows in the chambers, I had never experienced such a sensation of well-being. Thus, I walked silently under the comforting boughs. Fresh breezes stirred softly through them, enveloping me in a feeling of repose. Finding myself alone, I began to think about all that had occurred since my first encounter with Minister Clarencio. Which was really the dream world? The earth or the spirit colony? What had happened to Zelia and the kids? Why was I being given so many explanations concerning the most varied aspects of life, but without any mention of my former home? My own mother had refrained from providing me any direct information and had advised me to keep quiet about it. It all implied the need to forget the problems of the flesh so that I could work on my inner renewal. Yet, probing the recesses of my being, I discovered that my longing for my family was still alive and well. I ardently desired to see my beloved wife, to be kissed again by my little ones. Why should fate keep us apart now, as if I were a castaway on some unknown shore? At the same time, noble ideas comforted my soul. In fact, I wasn't a forsaken castaway, and if my earthly experience could be classified as having been a wreck, it had all been of my own doing. Now that I had the opportunity to observe new expressions of intense and constructive labor in Nasolar, I couldn't help but wonder how I could have wasted so much time on all sorts of trifles while on earth. I had truly loved my companion in struggle dearly, and had always tenderly cherished our children, but on critically examining my conduct as a husband and father, I realized that I had failed to create anything solid and useful in the spirit of my family members. I had realized my failure too late. Those who do not sow their fields in a way that will provide them with bread or those who do not guard the fountain that quenches their thirst, cannot expect to be provided with all they need. Such thoughts kept reoccurring in my mind with irritating vehemence. On leaving the physical sphere, I had been faced with the torture of not knowing what had happened to my wife and children, who had been taken from domestic stability to the shadows of widowhood and orphanhood. It was futile to even think about it. The light breeze seemed to whisper lofty ideas to my mind, as if desiring to awaken it into higher thoughts. The inner interrogations tortured me, but sticking to the imperatives of the task at hand, I approached the large gate and scanned the distance beyond the agricultural fields. All was moonlight and serenity, sublime sky and silent beauty, while in ecstatic contemplation of the picture, I spent a few minutes in wonder and prayer. A short time later, I saw in the distance two enormous shapes that really caught me off guard. They looked like men of some indefinable semi-luminous substance. Strange filaments hung from their arms and legs, and there was a long thread of indefinable length connected to their heads. I had the impression that I was seeing two ghosts. I couldn't handle it. My hair standing on end, I ran back to the chambers terrified. When I informed Narcissa of the incident, she could hardly keep from laughing. Well, my friend, she finally said good-naturedly, you didn't realize what those characters were. I was deeply disgruntled and couldn't answer her question. So Narcissa continued, A long time ago I had the same experience and was just as surprised as you. They are our own brothers from Earth. I mean, they are powerful spirits who live in the flesh on some redemptive mission, and as capable initiates of the eternal wisdom, they can temporarily abandon their physical bodies and travel about freely on our planes. 
filaments and threads you saw are characteristics that distinguish them from us. So you needn't fear. Incarnates who can come to these regions are extraordinarily spiritualized individuals, though they may appear humble or obscure on earth. And encouraging me kindly, she remarked, Let's go there. It's 1240, and the Samaritans could arrive at any moment. I was satisfied with her explanation and returned with her to the large gate. A long distance away by now, the two forms were calmly walking away from Nasalar. The nurse gazed at them, made an expressive gesture, and exclaimed, They are surrounded by light blue. They must be two very advanced messengers in the physical sphere and are here on some task we cannot know about. We stood there for several minutes lost in contemplation of the silent fields. A bit later, however, my kind friend pointed out a dark point on the moonlit horizon and remarked, Here they come. I could see the caravan moving towards us under the soft glow of the sky. All of a sudden, I heard the barking of dogs a long way off. What's that? I inquired, startled. Dogs, said the nurse. They are precious helpers in the dark regions of the umbral, which is inhabited not only by disincarnate human beings, but also by real monsters that I cannot begin to describe. In a loud voice, the nurse called to the servants, sending one of them to the chambers in order to inform the others of the Samaritan's arrival. I attentively gazed at the strange group slowly approaching us. Six big carts that looked sort of like stagecoaches were being led by a pack of happy and noisy dogs. The carts were being drawn by animals which, from a distance, looked like mules. But what caught my attention most were the large flocks of birds flying close to and over the carts and making strange sounds. Surprised, I turned to Narcissa. Where's the Airbus? Couldn't they use it in the umbral? When she told me they couldn't, I asked for an explanation. As usual, the attentive nurse explained, It's a problem of the density of matter. Think of water and air as an example. An airplane can fly through the atmosphere of the planet, but cannot move through the ocean. For that, we must build certain machines like submarines. Out of the spirit of compassion towards the suffering inhabitants of the umbral, the spirit communities of higher planes prefer to use transitional forms of transportation. Also, in many cases, we often can't do without the help of the animals. What do you mean? I asked, surprised. The dogs make the work easier. The mules patiently carry loads and supply warmth in the region when necessary. And those birds, she added, pointing to them in the air, are called traveling ibises. They help the Samaritans immensely by devouring hateful, wicked, and odious thought forms in the fight against the darkness of the umbral. The caravan was growing nearer. Narcissa gazed at me with kind attention and concluded, Right now there's no time for further explanations. The place to find out about the animals isn't here, but in the Ministry of Elucidation, where the complexes for instruction and experimentation are located. And, giving orders here and there, she prepared to receive the new spirit patients.